I'm Sarah Norcross and I'm the director of PET, Progress Educational Trust, a charity which aims to improve choices for people who are affected by infertility and genetic conditions. And today I'm going to be interviewing Professor Sir Mark Caulfield, who is the Scientific Officer at Genomics England, and he's stepping down from this role this summer, and so it seemed the perfect opportunity to ask him about his time at the 100,000 Genomes Project and Genomics England. So Mark, could you just explain what the aims of the 100,000 Genomes Project uh, were? There was general consensus that the moment was right for a free at point of care uh, transformational programme that would explore the role of whole genome sequencing. Expert groups were formed and they suggested that areas where whole genomes might be tractable to a true benefit in direct healthcare would include rare diseases, uh, cancer and infections. The programme was initially funded in England. Uh, we raised some money to involve Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales. So this was UK wide. Um, at the peak of the programme, up to 5,000 frontline NHS staff touched the programme at some point in their working week. We returned over 300 diagnoses made by researchers to the National Health Service. Uh, and the, this creates that virtuous circle, if you like, a form of infinity loop, where on one side you have research and the loop fuels healthcare gain, and then healthcare fuels further research, and then you fuel further healthcare gain. Could you perhaps give an example of how that research has um, has made a difference? So we have a child who was enrolled in the programme uh, uh, almost immediately after birth. He entered the neonatal intensive care with severe infections, changing neurology, and they thought he had some form of change in his immune system, but they couldn't find it. And sadly, at four months, he died and his parents were devastated. So they asked us to enrol him and we did this uh, for a number of families with deceased children. They want to know if they're going to have another kid like that uh, and whether they should have children at all. The other thing is it brings closure. It's very painful to lose a child. Not to understand why that's happened makes that much more difficult. And so in this child, we, we agreed to enrol them. But then mum unexpectedly became pregnant and said, look, you know, I don't want to know uh, the diagnosis. Don't tell me. But at month eight, she became anxious and said, look, I would like to know, uh, please, please do analyze the genome. And we found that this child had a defect in their ability to transport vitamin B12 inside cells. And that that had been the cause of all the symptoms and signs, um, but it hadn't been a considered diagnosis. So sometimes the genome can make the diagnosis for you when the clinical story doesn't add up. The child was born and one week later, the NHS had tested the child because they knew where to look. And sadly, this child was also affected. Um, but because that was known early in his course, he received weekly injections of vitamin B12 and his clinical course has been completely different. I can give you a second example, and this comes from severe infection. Um, there's a 10-year-old girl who had repeated admissions to hospital with severe infection. And um, she um, uh, was admitted with severe chickenpox. All immune testing and genomic testing had not revealed a cause, uh, we found a mutation in CTP synthase. And what this gene does is it uh, makes your what lymphocytes, the B and T cells that fight infection, work well. And if it's not functioning properly, you, you don't, they don't work well. And so she's at high risk of infections from bacteria and viruses. And she received a curative bone marrow transplant. An early issue that we faced was um, we wanted to try and use the whole genome to best effect. And one of the things we wanted to look at was, could we return additional findings to individuals? So here, our ethical advisory committee, made up of ethicists, lawyers, participants, uh, considered this issue and agreed that the moment was right to test whether feeding back additional findings had value for patients. Uh, and so what we did was convene expert groups that with the ethicists charted a course to feed back a limited number of conditions, which if you have the particular genetic change, you're really highly likely to get. And, you know, it's very much uh, a, a likelihood of that. Also, we tried to look at ones where 
knowing about it could bring you a benefit. So we have a, a, a person in the project with breast cancer who came from a family with no family history of breast cancer. So would never have been screened for BRCA mutations in the NHS. This lady had a BRCA2 change in her tumor. And then it, we also found that she got it in her germline, which is the DNA you and I inherit from our mom and dad. And so as a result, she was predisposed to have breast cancer. She had a daughter and she had a son and she had um, uh, two other male relatives. And BRCA is associated with breast and ovarian cancer. So she considered whether she, having past reproductive age, might have her ovaries removed. But her daughter had a BRCA test in her 20s and discovered she was also BRCA2 positive. And she's entered intensive breast screening at a much earlier age than she would. Her male siblings or uh, son are um, considering whether they have screening also for BRCA2 because it's a potential risk factor for prostate cancer. That BRCA2 finding has enabled collateral benefit for a whole family. And if we weren't feeding back those additional findings, we wouldn't have found that. But also that's an opportunity for that le young lady uh, to avoid what's happened to her mum. What we have to balance is people's right not to know if they choose not to know with the importance of that finding and its potential for their future healthcare. How um, has the project succeeded in um, embedding uh, genomics and the genomics medicine service um, in the NHS? Because I imagine that was a, a huge amount of work to get done. I could not look the 90,000 plus participants in the eye if we had not achieved a transformed uh, outcome. You know, we have people in the project with rare disease who had been waiting more than 30 years for a diagnosis that they hadn't received. And some of them have been in the project for seven years and still haven't got a diagnosis. And we're never going to give up looking for that for them. Equally so, we have people with cancer who benefited from the project. Um, but the legacy of the project will be that it transformed the genomic medicine in the UK. And to set that in context, there's good evidence from work done by the National Institutes of Health Research that it takes a median of nine to 16 years from the publication of a paper describing uh, a clinical change that is thought to be valuable for it to actually be embedded in guidelines. So we couldn't possibly have that. And that's why we created this hybrid uh, between research and the NHS such that those 5,000 frontline workers became ambassadors and champions for change. And when we proposed with NHS England, who led this, uh, a new genomic medicine service, people were up for it and also thought, I haven't done all this work to go back the way the way it was. Uh, and, and the way it was, Sarah, was, as you'll be familiar, there was a postcode lottery about what tests you could get. And in some parts of the country, you get quite good testing. In other parts of the country, it was almost nothing. Uh, the testing was um, um, variable and um, and often really highly dedicated, fantastic people in the NHS were using research money to try and secure diagnosis for patients because they felt this was the right thing to do. The first thing we did was to um, consider uh, a new national test directory, which is published and available on the web. Um, and that's a national test directory. It's not a guideline or a catalogue. It is a directory of tests that if you use them, you will be reimbursed for using them. My team and I reprofiled 300,000 tests, upgrading 25% new technologies. Uh, and also uh, Dame Sue Hill found money for half a million whole genomes. So NHS healthcare professionals can order against a, a list of diseases in the test directory for rare disease and cancer, whole genome sequencing. And that's the first health system where that can be ordered on a national basis. So the first country in the world where you as a healthcare professional against a test directory could order whole genome sequencing for your patients. That is, you know, is a huge achievement. Um, and I wanted to ask you about um, something that you've been mentioning um, throughout your answers, really. And that is about the patients or the participants in the project, because um, I believe that you've been instrumental in involving them in the project um, as a whole. My experience is that these people have trusted 
Genomics England and myself with their children's futures or their own diseases, and um, that they should have a strong say in, in what we do. And that's right, because actually, not only are they stakeholders because they have the disease, but they're stakeholders because they're part of the NHS uh, service and they fund it. There are some people who, who believe we shouldn't hold all this data and that, that, that um, it, it's not the right thing to do. However, if the people who are affected by the disorders uh, believe it's the right thing to do, who on earth are the rest of us to say it isn't? Uh, and we're not living with these things necessarily. Um, I've lived with relatives with cancer. I would like to change that. I have seen through this program the enormous love that parents give to their children with rare disease and also to other family members. If you have a severely physically or intellectually disabled child, it is a military operation to move that child around. We have people in the program who actually to be in the program, they lived in the middle of the UK, UK and they booked a room in a hotel to join the program at Great Ormond Street. And they got up at 5 a.m. for a 1 p.m. appointment to get their child ready for that appointment. That's how long it takes. From the main program, I can tell you about 20% of the participants have received a diagnosis, but that means there are 80% who haven't. So the job's not done and I'm determined, I haven't involved all these people in this program to walk away and leave them there, especially with so much residual unmet need. And the same is true in cancer. We're doing a pan-cancer analysis at the moment, and I think that will accelerate the adoption. Um, I hope to hear shortly that the NHS has adopted new and more cancers for whole genome sequencing. Data from West Midlands suggests that 25% of the cancer participants got something that altered their care. Um, and what might that be? Um, well, some of them got a finding that suggests that if they have specific anti-cancer medicines as chemotherapy, it would be harmful to them. So they were able to avoid that. Uh, some got evidence that they should have a different therapy for their disease than they were planning to have. For everything we've touched, there is some benefit in the health system in rare disease, cancer and infection. One of the things I've learned through this program is uh, there are a number of children who there is a what if moment. What if? we could have found this earlier. What would this child's life be? You may have seen that one of the first children that we fed back to in the program. Um, she was four when she joined the program and her mum and dad had noticed at four months she got intellectual delay. She wasn't developing as fast as others. And then she developed severe fits. And we found that this child had a change in a sugar transporter that transports sugar from the blood into the brain. As a result, um, she was having fits every time her blood sugar dropped down too low in the brain. And that's why no anti-epileptic medicine worked for her at all. Um, and the great thing about that is she could have a high fat diet. Now, a high fat diet um, works because you and I have a starvation mechanism in our brain that converts um, fat to sugar. It's to protect us if we have famine. And um, she can use that mechanism to generate her own sugar inside her brain and her seizures have dropped down and she's show, shown some intellectual improvement. What if we could have discovered that shortly after birth? What if we could have incepted the high fat diet then? We've looked at conditions that affect a child in the first five years of life. We found there are about 600 conditions, that is one in 190 live births, so nine children born every day in England um, who have um, a, a condition where the, their genetic makeup means at some point in their first five years of life, they will start to exhibit signs of the problem and uh, there is an intervention. For those conditions where we're confident that the child will really get the condition if we do nothing and there's an intervention, we want to create a platform for making that intervention the soonest possible moment after birth. And then if I look at what those interventions cost, only 8% are expensive, and the expensive ones are things like immunoglobulin, uh, organ transplants, sometimes bone marrow transplants, and then there are some expensive therapies. But let's consider that in context. Were we to have a program where every child was offered a whole genome at birth, 
uh, instead of the nine measurements we make today from the heel prick, we could use the heel prick. We know we can do a whole genome from the heel prick. Um, what if we had that um, genome and we could interrogate it at various points in your life as new knowledge occurred that meant there was something that could be of healthcare importance to you uh, at the request of the chief medical officer after Generation Genome was published. She wanted to look at the potential for whole genomes in uh, children. So she asked uh, me to chair a genomic analysis in children task and finish group. We recommended two things. One is that every child who, who goes into the pediatric or neonatal intensive care where there is no diagnosis should be offered a whole genome or genome sequencing of some sort uh, because there's good evidence now that it can help with diagnosis in between 37% and 57% of severely ill children. And the second thing we recommended was that with deep societal, ethical, and public and participant um, debate, we should consider a research program that would investigate the benefits or not of early diagnosis and early intervention in the first five years of life. One of the barriers to developing rare disease therapies is their expense because they don't often get an outlet and they're for very few people. What if you could use that platform to create uh, um, uh, a giant platform for therapeutic innovation? And because um, you've sequenced many of the newborns, you know who has potential to have the disease, you can then fuel a development pipeline because you know that and you can do research. And one of the things I sensed from my discussions with the, the participants, those, of, those uh, looking at their loved ones with the disease, they are disproportionately elated to receive a diagnosis because they've usually spent six years not getting one or longer. Some have spent 30 years, as I said before. But also their next question as a mum or dad is, so is there anything that can be done about this? And all too often the answer is, uh, there's nothing at the moment. Well, why don't we just change that? Why don't we make a decision as a country um, or as a global community that if we created the platform for innovation and uh, drugs have to be made really by industry, um, universities can invent the concept and take it so far, but to bring it safely to use in the health system, it does require industrial money. I wanted to sort of go back to something you mentioned earlier about the three areas of interest to the project, which was yes. rare disease and cancer, which I think um, at the, the start of the project and certainly in the first few years were everybody's main focus. And I think um, people sort of forgot slightly perhaps about the serious infectious disease element. Um, but of course, now um, we're sort of in the COVID era and we're thinking about <laughs> about that perhaps more than the other two and I wondered um, what um, Genomics England um, involvement in the fight against the pandemic had been. Working with um, colleagues at the University of Edinburgh we built um, a program called Genomic which has been looking at the genetic basis of the human response to COVID and trying to understand why some people get really severely ill and go to intensive care and others have a very mild or asymptomatic course. And not with whole genomes, but just with um, genotyping, which is a sparser map of your and my genome. Um, we found seven regions that make you more likely to have a severe course. We're trying to contribute at every level of the pandemic, both within those who are severely ill and hospitalized those who are mildly affected and what differentiates them, but also those who sadly have persistent symptoms that last for longer than three months. Severe life-threatening pandemics can actually reveal causes and shine a light on regions of your and my genetic code. That may allow us to incept uh, therapies that we can repurpose and bring to bear that we would not have thought of. We may have vaccines and they're helping us a lot already. We can see that. But the reality is this won't go away because this virus is now endemic in our communities and it will find new ways of, of evolving. Uh, hopefully one day it will evolve in a way that is disadvantageous to the virus. So far it hasn't shown much signs of doing that uh, with new variants, the alpha variant and the delta variant. And finally, um, what would be the... Uh 
one piece of advice that um, you'll give to your successor? My one counsel would be um, the most important things here are number one, the participants, number two, the participants, number three, the participants. Thank you very much, um, Professor Sir Mark Caulfield, um, for that um, interview. And I'm, I'm sure people watching this will um, join um, us at PET and wishing him the best of luck for his future endeavours. Thank you.